Okay. So I would like to share with you some ideas about um, sequential testing and how we can use information criteria for sequential testing. But first, I would like to thank the organizers to organize this amazing amazing day. I learned a lot watching the videos of the previous years, and I learned a lot today too. So thank you. So what about sequential testing? If you are an experimentalist, when you're planning your next experiment, you probably have to make a lot of different decisions. Once you know want what you, you want to test and how you want to test it, you might have to think about which sample to use and how big should be this sample. If you are a user of significance testing, the most common approach is consisting in trying to guess, trying to estimate the effect size you're looking for, and then plugging this number in what I call the magic hat, which is the power function of your statistical test, then the magic hat will give you a magic number, which is the sample size you need to show the point, the, the point you want to make. But this method requires you to have at least a rough idea of the effect size you're looking for. And but if you know if you knew what effect size you were looking for, maybe you would not bother making an experiment at all. So another approach consists in recruiting participants, accumulating observation uh, until you reach a predefined level of evidence. But this requires that we have a way of quantifying it evidence. And to answer this question, uh, Felix Schoenbrunn and collaborators developed a method that they presented into paper published last year, which is the sequential base factor procedure. Basically, the idea is that you define a priori uh, boundary of evidence, like you say, I will stop recruiting my participant when my base factor reaches 10 for the alternative hypothesis or 10 for the null hypothesis. And this animation shows this procedure. On the x-axis, you have the sample size. On the y-axis, you have the value of the base factor. The base factor are symmetric around 1. And we can fix a priori a boundary for the null hypothesis or the alternative hypothesis of 1 to 10 or 10. And when this boundary is reached, you stop your recruitment. And this simulation shows, uh, this animation shows many simulated experiments. Each gray line is a simulated experiment. And this corresponds to a t test for independent samples with a medium effect size. And in this situation, in, in this particular scenario, we can uh, observe that many simulation will hit the boundary for the alternative hypothesis quite quickly, like before 100 participants. Okay, this works very well, and they provide a very detailed table of the properties of this procedure uh, for different boundaries. For instance, if you fix your boundary at a base factor of 3, 5, 6, 7, 10, for different effect size and different priors on the alternative hypothesis, and they provide uh, the four what they call the percentage of wrong inference, which is a combination of false positive and false negative. A false positive is when the base factor reaches the boundary for the null hypothesis when there is actually an effect, and a false, uh, maybe I, I made a mistake, but anyway, you understood that. A false negative is when the base factor reaches the boundary for the null hypothesis when there is actually an effect, and the reverse. So they, provi they provide the percentage of wrong inference in each situation, plus the average sample number, which is the average sample size at which the boundaries reach uh, in each situation. For instance, if you fix a boundary to a base factor of 6, and uh, the, true the population effect size is 0.4, and you have um, yeah usual uh, prior on the, on the alternative <laughs> hypothesis, you will reach this boundary approximately on average at 90 participants with only 2% of wrong inference in the long run, which is quite cool. Okay, um, I wanted to make an aside about statistical goals and statistical tools. As users of statistics, we might want to answer different goals. For instance, we might want to quantify the relative evidence for an hypothesis or for a model. If we want to do that, we could use base factor, but not, not every tool is as much as appropriate as base factor to do that. In contrast, if we want to make a decision between hypotheses while controlling our error rates in the long run, we might want to use base, um, p values and significance testing instead. Another question that we would like to, might want to, to answer is to compare the relative predictive abilities of our model. And if we want to do that, the most appropriate tool would be to use cross validation or information criteria. So this, I wanted to, to discuss this slide just to, as, to have remember that we can have very different goals and we have a lot of statistical tools that we can use and some tools are more appropriate for some goals. But if we try, if we try to answer the first question with less appropriate uh, tool, yeah, we might, we, we might obtain suboptimal responses. 
Okay, what about information criteria? We know that the negative log likelihood of a model plus two times its number of parameters is, is approximately equal to the out of sample deviance of a model. Okay, what does it mean? Uh, the in sample deviance in simple words is measuring uh, how bad is a model to explain the current data set. You have a data set, you fit a model, and you're measuring how bad is the model to explain the current data set. The out of sample deviance is measuring how bad is the model to explain a future data set issued from the same population, which is arguably more interesting than in sample deviance. We would like to have, we would like to be able to build models that are good to predict future data. And we know that the, e the EIC is giving an approximation of this out of sample deviance. So in simple world, the EIC is giving an approximation of the predictive ability, the ability of the model to predict future data. I think it's crazy. Like have a, we have a way to yeah, to know how the model will behave in the future, to predict future data. You should not interpret the EIC in absolute term because it depends heavily on the, um, the size of the data set. So we usually rescale this uh, EIC scores, uh, the e this EIC value by uh, subtracting, subtracting to each EIC value the EIC of the model with the minimum EIC value. For instance, if you're comparing five models, you're going to subtract to each EIC value the EIC of the model with the minimum value. So it means that the delta score of the uh, best model will be zero, and all other delta score, delta score will be deviation from the best model. Then we can normalize this, uh, this delta score to obtain what we call AKK weights. So each model will have a weight that we can interpret as the probability, the probability of this model being the best a KEK model of the set. Okay, I'm almost done with the mathematical details. Uh, these weights that we can interpret as the probability of this model being the best information theoretic model, we can compare these weights between models and we can take the ratio of weights that, that we will call uh, evidence ratios. And this evidence ratio, a, they are, uh, um, yeah, we can interpret them and the same, uh, yeah, sorry, I'm going to start again. If you have an evidence ratio of 10, for instance, you can say that what this model is 10 times more credible to be the best model, most it's, yeah, credible to be the best model in terms of AIC. Okay, so we have two ratio. We have the base factor, which is a ratio of marginal likelihoods, uh, and we have the evidence ratio, which is the ratio of AKK weights. These two ratio have very different uh, synthetic properties because they answer different question. Uh, not all base factor, but the default test base factor is said to be consistent for model identification. It means that if you're comparing two models, one of them being the true model, when a sample size is going to infinity, you will identify the true model, so the model that generated the data with, with probabi probability going to one. The EIC and the EIC based evidence ratio is not consistent for model identification. It means that even if the true model is in the set of model, the EIC might choose another model because the true model might sometimes not be the best model to explain future data, to predict data. But the EIC uh, is not consistent, but it is an efficient estimator of the cool-back liberal information loss. In simple words, it is equivalent to the out-of-sample deviance, the expected out-of-sample deviance. Okay, uh, so what's the point of all of this? All of this? Uh, we usually when we evaluate the properties of model selection procedures, we use simulations and we compare two nesting models, one of them being the true model. It looks like this. For instance, we could have uh, a first model, an intercept-only model, which is the true model when the effect size is equal to zero. And we usually compare this model with another one, which is an augmented model. We just have add an effect of the group. And this augmented model is the true model when the effect size is different from zero. And this situation is very nicely addressed by using base factor or the Bayesian information criteria, for instance, which aim at identifying the true model in the set of models. However, this goal of identifying the true model assumes that there is actually a true model in the sets. We could rather be interested in identifying not the true model, but the best model, the model that makes the best prediction. So as an example, we're going to simulate data from this model, from the following model, which assumes tapering effect size. Let's say that we have eight uh, predictors, okay? And what I mean by tapering effect size is that you have some big effect size followed by some medium effect size, then followed by a lot of very small effects. And this true data generating process 
is according to me more uh, plausible as a real data generating process that we can find in biological sciences or social sciences. Like you have some very huge causes of the phenomenon of the phenomenon you're measuring, then you have m maybe some uh, medium predictors, and then you have a lot of very minor influences. Okay, so we can generate data from this model. Then we can compare two nested models that are and neither of them being the true model that generated the data. So we have a true model that generated the data, this one, and then we compare two models that are not the true model. And we can compare the, prof the um, properties of the base factor procedure and the uh, AIC based evidence structure procedure uh, on this comparison. So on the left, in red, you have the, the evolution of the base factor, and in blue, on the right, the evolution of the evidence ratio. On the x-axis, you have the sample size from 50 to 1,000, and the y-axis, you have the value of the base factor uh, or evidence ratio. This is the, the, um, yeah, the equality line, and if the, the base factor is below the line, it means that it chooses the reduced model. If it's above the line, it means that it chooses the, the augmented model. So what we can see is that uh, the base factor always shows the, the reduced model, even at sample size close to 1,000. This each gray line represents a simulated experiment. I've run 10,000 of them, and this is the median of the distribution. Uh, in comparison, the evidence ratio is very skept. Yeah, it cannot sh it doesn't choose. is close to one uh, at the beginning, and qu quite quickly shows the augmented model. And this, simula this simulation are summarized in this table. What we see is that if we fix a boundary for the base factor at 3, 6, or 10, it will choose the reduced model quite quickly with uh, in 98% of the case. The EISN is the average sample number, so I didn't explain the table. The EISN is the average sample number, which is the average sample size at which the boundary is rich. The lower rate is the proportion of it of the lower boundary. Uh, this is the proportion of it of the upper boundary, and this is the proportion of simulation that it neither of the boundary. So the base factor is hitting the lower boundary, so it means that it chooses the reduced model most of the time and quite quickly. But the evidence ratio is choosing the augmented model quite um, yeah lately in the process, but it chooses the augmented model in most of the sit in most of the cases. Okay, um, so the take-home messages. Uh, we should be aware that in many situations, both procedures will select the same model. But what I would like to emphasize is that the properties of uh, model selection based on base factor or BIC, they are usually evaluated using simulation in which we try to identify the true model. And we could question whether it is sensible to assume a true model in social sciences or um, biological sciences. I would suggest that we could use more realistic simulation studies in which we try not to find the best model, uh, not, not, not to find a true model, which does not exist, but to try the, the most useful model instead. And as Finlay notes, consistency can sometimes be an undesirable property in the context of selecting a model. In other words, the goal of identifying a true model works fine when there is a true model to be identified. So I'm going just to give a brief example on uh, how you could do uh, sequential testing using information criteria, using the STISO package, this package, uh, to compare two BRMS models using the WAIC, which is a generalization of the AIC that can be used to compare Bayesian model. So you can fit your BRMS model as usual, and then using the CKR function, you can choose the information criteria you want to use. Um, specifying your model 1 and model 2, the sample size at which you want to start doing sequential testing and the random effect in your models. And you can plot that to see the, evolu the evolution of this ratio according to, to the sample size. Uh, okay, that's it for me. Uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. And this project is still in progress, so I'm welcoming comments and suggestions for improvement, of course. Thank you.